We're going to start up in a second, folks. Thank you so much for joining me if you are joining me live. A lot of the team. We'll look see what people are I know what I'm doing. Someone's starting a meeting. That's, that's novel. I'm not sure they know how this is working. The things here. <laughs> Because that means I think I'm going to get this show on the road. My slides are working. I think they're working. They're ready to go. To rock and roll, folks. Good morning, folks. Welcome to Comp1720 slash 6720. My name is Charles Martin. I'm from the ANU School of Computing. I am your lecturer in this course. Thank you so much for joining me on this exciting journey into art and interaction computing this morning. This is our first week, uh, our first lecture. It is week one. I'm sure that there are things that aren't quite clear to you, maybe. There are folks joining me who haven't quite enrolled in the class yet. I'm certainly just, just getting everything spun up. I think we've gotten almost everything organized uh, for the course, but always in week one, there are a few stresses, things we didn't quite expect to happen. And it's a, it's a bit of sorting out in the first few days. I'm sure that's the case for you and all of your other courses as well. So I'm, I'm hoping that some folks are joining me for this online lecture because I've got some questions questions for you and um, the place that you'll be discussing those questions will be on Microsoft Teams. Everyone is in the Microsoft team, I know because I have a script which adds everyone to it. So there should be um, folks in the team watching our, our lecture. I'm gonna open the team now just so you can see what's going on. See my many teams, look, I'm a the reality of work at the ANU these days is that all of your lecturers will be in about a thousand different teams because that's often how we get work done. Um, sorry that the text is going to be extremely small for you, but I just wanted to um, at the whole team and say, folks, week one lecture, oh, lecture is on, join us for some discussion. What you might see if you if you open Microsoft Teams is that we have a uh, oh the weird name for that tab it's called Comp seventeen twenty six seven twenty 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 two that's actually the lecture chat and I'm going to be in an infinite loop here oh someone's joining me from the the Twitch chat yeah so g'day Melody g'day Emma thank you so much for joining me 
Um, I'm glad I've got some folks in. I know that there's 19 people streaming. There's me. I'm here. So I don't want to over-egg it, but this is, I guess, the default way of, of doing viewing your streams is through Teams. We have a, a stream going in that tab. I might rename that tab so it's clear. Lecture. Stream. And I'm going to move it so it's at the, like the absolute next one. Can I, can I remove it? Folks are jumping into the chat. Thank you so much for jumping in and let me know you're here. Um, I can't move that one because uh, stupid teams. It, it's got this like template when you're a class and it's got extra tabs. Anyway, Ichan is there. I know I've got a bunch of folks here. Um, I know there are folks who like to watch this on YouTube. If you are in Australia, or somewhere else in a place where YouTube or Twitch are available, I do highly recommend that you watch on YouTube or Twitch because um, without being disparaging towards um, the system called Microsoft Stream, YouTube and Twitch are generally a better um, performing platform for live streaming videos. They have a shorter latency, they have less problems and better resolution. So you can see that on my, my system on Restream, I stream to YouTube, Twitch, and Microsoft Stream simultaneously. The MS Stream one is great because it's part of Microsoft's ecosystem. That means that folks anywhere in the world, if they're able to access a new website, so they'll be able to access the stream. But, but that means I've got chat across three platforms, and I'm um, really only interested in having class discussions on a new platforms. So I'm, I'm happy for me to appear to you on YouTube, but if you want to talk to me, it has to be on an ANU platform. So Teams is our live lecture chat place. So if you have any questions or comments during this lecture, chuck them in Teams. I, I know folks love to do some memes on, on Twitch. If you want to do that, that's fine, but I probably won't see it and um, unless I jump in at some stage. But, you know, if everyone wants to follow me on, you know, hit the bell or whatever on YouTube or, or um, follow me on Twitch, much appreciated, I suppose. Um, Twitch has some kind of, like, tier thing where you, like, get more followers, you get more stuff, and I'm at some kind of level. And, I, you know, they gamify it, so you always want to be at the next level, don't you? We all want to be at the next level. That is potentially the quote of the day. Week one, coding art. What are we going to do today? We're going to look at some of the basic outline of this course so you understand what you're in for. This, in my humble opinion, is one of the most exciting courses at the ANU. So you are in a privileged and lucky position. You get to code in a programming language called JavaScript using a system called p5.js and you get to make really cool artworks with it. So you'll be uh, building your skills in coding and programming You'll be building your skills in creativity. Creativity is a skill that you need to practice. It's not some magical thing that happens to you one day. Uh, every week in this course, you get to practice your creativity. You'll also be building your skills in interactive, if, if interactivity, interacting between a human and a computer, which is a really exciting field and could be really mind-blowing for you if you go deep on it this semester. So here we are. Folks, before we get too much into it, I want to just acknowledge that this course builds on more than 60,000 years of culture in this country. The culture of the First Nations people of Australia, the Aboriginal people, uh, many Aboriginal um, civilizations and, and uh, peoples and cities and tribes and various groups have lived in Australia for more than 60,000 years. And this culture that this class is building goes on top of that. So I acknowledge and celebrate the First Nations people on whose lands we're meeting. That's the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples. And I want to pay my respects to elders past and present who are responsible for this country. Um, and Canberra is a wonderful place. It's so wonderful that we now have these great links with our First Nations people. But I acknowledge that the, the process of reconciliation between folks uh, like me, who are derived from, from colonists to Australia and the First Nations people, it's a difficult process which is still ongoing. My name is Charles. G'day. <laughs> I am a computer scientist, but my research area is in music technology and creative computing. 
So I work in music tech, musical AI, and human computer interaction here at the Australian National University. I teach Comp 1720 slash 6720 Art and Interaction Computing. I've just finished teaching uh, last semester Comp 2300, a course called Program, uh, what is it called? Computer Organization and Program Execution. Can't forget that one. And I have just uh, started this semester also teaching a course called Laptop Ensemble, which is our course in music computing, um, and hoping to spin that up into a more significant course in later, later semesters. Um, you can read more about me if you want on my website, which is charlesmartin.com.au. You can look at my research and see what I'm doing, and, um, but that's not required, it's not examined, it's not on the exam, there is no exam in this course, so it can't be on the exam. Maybe there should be an exam, it's just on, on contents of my past papers. It would be a very, a, a very clueless academic thing to do. Now folks, I want to hear something from you. So I've seen a few check-ins on the team. Um, I'm really happy to see those. I would like you to answer one of these questions for me. Tell me one boring fact about yourself, or tell us about a food that everyone likes but you hate, or tell us about your favorite underrated video game character. So you get a few minutes, I'm just gonna sip my coffee. As I wait for the very creative uh, introductions to roll in on the team. While I'm waiting, I'm going to direct you. If you're in a, in a um, I don't know, my tab open, if you're on a browser right now, which you should be, open up in a tab the course website, which is comp.anu.edu.au slash courses slash comp1720. Here it is, the course website. Folks, you may be used to different kinds of courses that have the course materials in different places. You might have seen courses that have course materials in Wattle. Um, I think we probably have a Wattle for this course. Actually, I haven't checked. <laughs> Do we? <laughs> we, in general, there's a Wattle for every course. Oh yeah, here it is. It's been transferred from last year. Um, this is the, the Wattle for this course. It doesn't have much on it. It basically just has a list of links to, um, pages on our regular course website, which is lives at the ANU School of Computing, comp.anu.edu.au. A lot of computing courses, we like to have our own websites because, you know, we think we're cool web developers and, and like to play with JavaScript and stuff, um, which is really exciting. Oh, here's Melody, they, them. They always wear a flannel. They really hate olives. Theo from Celeste, you don't have to answer every question, Melody, but, but thank you for, uh, for um, you know, overachieving. <laughs> I don't even, I don't know what Celeste is, and I don't even know what Theo is. I, well, I don't know what Theo is, and I don't even know what Celeste is. That must be some Gen Z thing, Gen Z. Oh my gosh, Emma doesn't like mint choc ice cream? Wow. Sarah hates avocado. Oh my gosh. I think the, the food that you like but everyone else, that you hate that everyone else likes is a, going to be a contentious question. Maybe I shouldn't have asked that. It's going to be folks outing themselves on their, their food preferences. Okay, so we've got some exciting answers there. I know that I've got at least four people watching. Oh, is there someone else there? Chan Hung doesn't like sweet cakes, oh, but they're so delicious. Josh, neophage phobia. So is that the fear of eating new things? I guess that must be tricky to deal with. Okay, apparently I should check out Celeste. What platform do I, is this some kind of steam thing? What platform is Celeste on? Harry hates barbecue sauce. Zephan or Frank uh, likes Onion Knight in Dark Souls 3. Any, I think, actually. Okay, I'll have a look for Celeste. It sounds like, just from the name of it, it sounds like a kind of JRPG-inspired thing. Is that right? Or is it a kind of 
I think of them as Gen Z platformers, really hard platformers. Okay. So if you jump into the chat, if you haven't entered in your answer to one of these questions, I'm, I'm really, really happy to have your interaction on Teams. Basically, this is the way that we will talk during the lectures is you'll just jump in on Teams and tell me stuff. And if you have a question or a thought at any time, um, I'm, I'm really happy to have it on the team. If you have a thought outside of lecture, we'll put it on the, on the forum, which we'll discuss in a minute. But the, uh, the, the general vibe is that I focus on doing a video lecture in this course. It's, it's a style that I have for my teaching, which is to do really great videos, stream them on, on YouTube and Twitch, record them really well so that folks can refer to them later if they, if they want. Uh, I know that not everyone likes to go to lectures, but I do know that there are folks who love to tune into a lecture at a regular time each week and use that to structure their study. And I'm totally here for that. Um, for those folks, please make sure you open up your team and talk to me during the lecture. It gives me something to talk about and lets me know that someone's watching. Um, and I can also address any concerns or thoughts or questions that you might have during the lecture. Definitely, it's a, I found out now that, that Celeste is one of those really hard platformers. It may indeed be too hard for me. I'm not sure that um, I'll be able to handle, handle a difficult platformer. Okay, more folks jumping in. Ezio Aldatori is the fave underrated game character. I'm not sure who that is, but what game is that from? Okay, what's this course about? This is a course about making interactive art with computers. Making interactive art with computers. Those four words, making interactive art and computers. Making, this is a course where we make every single week. You make every single assignment and you make for your major project. Every week you will make new computer artworks. If you have one thing to take away from this lecture, it's that the code word for this, this um, course is make. Your best thing you can do is make new things to practice your skills. This is not the kind of course where you need to read the whole textbook before you start doing. I want you to jump into P5, try making things, look at tutorials, experiment, try different things each week and really build your skills at being creative every week and making. The only rule is make. Interactive. So this is not just flat artworks, it's not just about animations, it's about interactive artworks. What does that mean? It's interaction between the humans who are watching an artwork and the computer system. And through some kind of interaction, we have a better experience or an expanded experience or a more engaging experience. Now this is something which is really exciting, but it's also very hard, very hard. So we need to build our skills again. If we've got good making skills, we're practicing our making every week. We're experimenting with different kinds of interactions as when we get to that in the course a little bit later. It could be something which is challenging for you the more you think about it. It's one of those things that seems easy, like, oh, move the mouse, things work, cool. Seems like it's, it's easy to get interaction. It's hard when you work out that you want it to work well and you try it with other people. And it hopefully could be the start of a journey for you in studying interaction between computers and humans, which is a fascinating field. The art bit, art. We will learn some theory of art to give you some knowledge that will back up your skills in making. You'll get some theory about both artistic and sound and music computing so that you have lots of ideas and that allow you to um, that give you grist for the mill in your making process. That means some ideas for you to develop, some ideas for you to turn into amazing interactive artworks. With computers. So we need to learn some programming to do the making. We will cover the basics of coding in a language called JavaScript, a really famous programming language. The great thing about JavaScript is that it is a programming language which runs in your web browser. So your web browser will be running the programs that you write in this, this course and all of your programs will kind of exist in a sort of website uh, that you will develop each week. This doesn't mean that it's a course about HTML, CSS. Um, there are other courses at the ANU about web design, 
this is not a web design course. It's a, it's a course in artistic computing, creative computing, that happens to use JavaScript. And it so happens that the web browser is a great place to have a interactive artwork based on a computer here in 2022. Uh, and so we will do some code theory to do with JavaScript that more or less um, follows along with some of the aspects in um, Comp 1110. It's a similar kind of language doing some structured programming. We don't go into the depth in, in, as would be done in Comp 1110 because we have to do all of the art and the interaction stuff as well. The assumption with the coding for folks who are in this course, who are watching the video right now, if you're wondering, I make no assumption that you've done any coding ever before in your life. So there's definitely folks who take this course who are computer science majors. You might have done Comp 1100 in your first semester. You might have done software design development in high school and come in as a, as a CS major and you are taking this as an elective. And you might find that the coding is quite easy to start with, but that the art and interaction stuff is pretty hard. There are also folks who join this course who have never done any coding before in their life. Maybe they've got some backing in art or interaction from other courses or other fields, but the coding bit can be a bit of a challenge. What I want to say to them is that we're here for you. There are folks with who are absolutely new to coding who do really well in this course. There are folks who are new to coding who get HDs, who end up as tutors and work with us for many years. So we are here for you. You can be successful in this course. What you must do is be patient with yourself because Sometimes computer programming is frustrating. And if you go to your labs, ask any of the computer, computer science majors if computing is frustrating sometimes and they will tell you many stories about things that go wrong with programming and frustrate them for days and then they figure it out and it was all easy afterwards. So there's a, there's a typical process with programming about getting frustrated um, and overcoming issues with communicating with your computer, getting it to do what you want it to do. Everyone in this course has it, whether you're new or not. Um, but <laughs> there's folks saying it's, it's never always frustrating. It never ends. Definitely, definitely, definitely true. The yes. So what we what I will say is that in the first six weeks, we cover most of the code theory in the course. So there's definitely a few students always in about week six who come to me and say, oh, I'm really worried. I haven't been keeping up with it. But that's good because They've, they've seen how the, some of the tricky things had the frustrating experiences and they're probably just about to become more relaxed with it over the mid-semester break towards the major project, which I'll talk about in a minute. So making interactive art with computers, those four words are the, the cornerstones of this course. And I'll keep hitting those as we go through these, these many weeks of lectures, 12 weeks of lectures we've got ahead of us. So admin corner, first thing we do every week is admin corner. We've got a coffee. I've got my coffee here. I, I love this photo. It's from more than 10 years ago. Now you can see my gen one iPad here. Um, and a really good espresso I had that day. I don't have an espresso right now. I've actually got an instant coffee. I had a better coffee before, but I wanted a second coffee and didn't have time to think about it. Okay, lectures. Online lecture is 10 a.m. Monday. If you're here, you already know that. If you're not here, you don't know that yet, but it's here on 10 a.m. Monday, streamed live on Teams, YouTube, and Twitch every week. There's some folks who've already told me they're having connection issues with Teams. I'll just, just look at Restream. Um, not having any issues on Restream, oh, except it wants a slow, lower bit rate. Yeah, I don't see any issues here. I'd, I'd love to be in 60 FPS, but um, Microsoft Stream doesn't support it. So we're stuck at 30 FPS and we're stuck at um, full HD. So now, yeah, live fair, everything seems fine. Yeah, if you have issues with Teams, jump on YouTube. If you have issues with YouTube, jump on Twitch. But YouTube is usually the most stable and Twitch um, maybe uh, more or less the same and then Teams has issues sometimes, sorry about that. Slides and recordings will be on the website. You can see the website here. Uh, have our lecture page. We've already got all 12 weeks of slides here. I'll actually be going through and cutting some slides because I'm just focusing down on the topics which I think are really important. 
Last year I kind of expanded the slides a lot, had a lot, many too many, and this year I just want to make sure I communicate the most important stuff in our lectures. So there might be some slides being refocused or combined or deleted over the next few weeks, particularly in the first half of the course. Second half is a bit tighter. Uh, you can also download all the slides as PDFs on the Cloud Store. I've got a shared folder here. Um, these are still all the ones from last year, actually. I'll update these later today with the current actual version of the slides that um, I will be presenting. Uh, and you can see the website versions of all of these um, pages over time. So you can see what we're going to be doing. This is today's lecture, then next week, variables and chants. Week three, conditionals, iteration and colors, which is really fun. Week four, functions, arrays and critique. Week five, objects and interaction. This is where we start to get to the interactive art bit of the course. Code concepts and other statements. I might adjust that one a bit. Week six is not, not working that well. I might move up sound and music computing. So we do that in week six, actually. Week seven, sound and music computing. Week eight, storyboards, interaction design. Week nine, recent developments and beyond, which is cool. And then week 10, 11, and 12, data art, different kinds of art, actually. Data art, artificial life art, a life art. And week 12 is AI and ML art or generative art. Three really fun, interesting topics. So those are the topics for the course. My aim, a personal goal, I feel like I lecture best when I'm typing code. So I'm going to lecture for two hours every week in this course this year. I'm going to try to do one hour of slides and one hour of code. And we'll see if I make it. So please hold me accountable to that. I don't, I guess you could make some kind of, someone can make an app or something. Um, but to keep work out my live coding, but it's really fun to, to code ideas while talking about them. And it's challenging and it's unique and interesting. So we feel like we're having a shared experience when we do that. Labs. Labs are both on or offline in this course. We have um, in-person labs I'm, uh, for folks who are able to come. You are expected to attend your weekly lab session either online or offline. And here's my first question. Sign up on my timetable. Um, is there any folks who are having issues with my timetable so far? Or um, is everyone comfortable with it? So chime in on the chat or put your hand up if, if you have not yet signed up for a lab on my timetable. Um, I'll see what happens in the chat in a few seconds when the, the loop is complete. My timetable, obviously it's a new system, brand new system rolled out across ANU. They were trialing it in one college in semester one, I believe, and now it's rolled out across everything. Um, ANU has 25,000 students, so rolling out a new timetable system for 25,000 students with all of the courses, I don't know how many courses we run each semester, a lot, is a challenging ask. Uh, so it is, I think that they've done very, very well to get it done with a minimum of downtime or problems, but there have been a few little issues. I'm just curious about the student perspective. My perspective, as I can see, maybe like 60% of the folks who were currently enrolled had picked a lab on my timetable. So it's still 40% yet to do it. You need to pick one this week. I don't know how I'm gonna, what stick I've got to, to throw at you if you haven't done it, but I'll think of one. Um, still learning about some of the my timetable things. On and offline labs. So basically, if you're in Canberra, if you're available, generally available to go to a lab, you don't have any exceptional circumstance, I expect you to be there in person every week. Um, I know that there's certainly worries about COVID this semester. Folks, you're expected to be there in person with a mask on every week. Um, there's free masks available from ANU. The, the P2 um, N95 masks, masks that they give out, I find them uh, quite a good fit for me. Um, I know certainly folks have different shaped face or, or different things that they can, can and can't wear. Might not work with glasses. I don't know. I don't wear glasses. Someone says it seems user friendly. So that's good. Um, that was about my timetable. Haven't heard from anyone who hasn't had success with it. So I guess it's working from everyone. Anyone got a comment about my timetable? Just chuck it in the chat now. I'm, I'm actually curious. 
I don't know what it's like for a student to use my timetable because I haven't had time to talk to anyone about it yet. This is the first day, so <laughs> um, I haven't, haven't got that perspective. Of course, this week, if you can't, if you are feeling sick, if you actually have COVID and have to isolate, or if you have someone in your family that you're caring for, please don't come to the labs. So in that case, every single lab also has, or will have a team channel on the team where the tutors will be running a meeting. We do have folks who are um, uh, not in Australia and I've asked them to, we'll ask them to pick one of the online lab um, entries in my timetable. That's basically so I know that you're an online only student because I might have some specific messages. Regular, peop regular folks in Canberra available to go to labs, choose one of the in-person labs and attend it as much as you can. And if you ever can't attend that session, just switch into the Teams channel with the online students. So there should be groups of folks every week. Some of the tutors will also not be able to go to the lab and they'll join online. So there'll be that, that issue as well. Um, I would ask everyone to, first of all, look after your own safety and look after the safety of your colleagues in labs. That means wearing a mask every single time. I, I really, really, really hope to see, when I walk around the labs, be seeing the best masks that people can get. Um, I think that the, the P2 and 95 ones are really probably known to be superior to, to the cloth ones. Um, uh, but obviously I'm not going to make judgments on person, people's individual circumstances. Keep yourself safe, keep your colleagues safe, wear a mask, don't show up to labs if you are sick. Um, you don't, doesn't need to be a huge fuss about it. If you're sick and you can't come to the lab, just pop into the team at the start of your lab, into the channel for your lab and let your tutor know that you'll be attending online and they will chat to you a few times in the lab and make sure you're on task. In each of these labs, you'll get a new set of art and code challenges to work through each week. They're pretty fun, actually. The labs are gonna give you all the skills that you need to do the assignments and the major projects in this course, and you'll have weekly pre-lab tasks that will be due before the start of your lab. So we'll talk about that in a minute. It's a special assessment item that's quite interesting. So those are the labs. Everyone seems positive about my timetable. Someone's saying, it's brilliant, which is great. Brilliant system. Someone said that they just realized it exists, but seems good. Yep, folks, if you've just realized it exists, um, by default, it is the way for choosing tutorials and labs and small group times for all of your courses at ANU. In, in computing, we used to use a system called Streams. Um, I think basically no one is using Streams now. We've just been shifted over to the new system. Um, there may be, I'm not sure about everyone's individual situations. There may be some course that uses Streams for something, but not this course. So if you don't know what Streams is, don't worry, it's now gone. <laughs> Not using it anymore. Ah, yeah, someone says, pretty good, though it'd be nice to see tute slots from different courses at the same time so you can see clashes more easily. Yep, fair call. Um, folks, if you have feedback like that, that's really important feedback. I'm sure that there's some kind of feedback point for my timetable. The, the good thing about my timetable from my perspective is that it, um, or the bad thing about it is that uh, I, I can't control it. I don't know what it's controlled by someone else, but also the good thing from my perspective is I can't control it. So I have no, um, I have no ability to, to influence what's going on and I don't have to worry about it. I can send you somewhere else to complain. Whereas Streams was sort of owned by computing. Folks, the funny thing, someone says Streams was not great. You know what, when Streams was great, when I was a computer science student at ANU, a long time ago, an undergrad, we used streams. It is old. It is old. But wildly, it has kind of been good. And it's been, I think it's been running for almost 20 years, or maybe a little bit more. And it was the first way we were able to, to give students the ability to choose labs in computing way back around 20 years ago this was available it wasn't this was before the ANU even had any kind of like courseware system Wattle didn't exist that was this was before Moodle existed there was another system that came in at some point called WebCT um, which was but I think that streams outdated all of these systems um, at ANU so can you imagine being a student where you didn't have any 
there was no online timetable, right? This was, there was not even, barely even a website. The, the ANU did have a website, but it didn't have information about each course. If you wanted information about courses, you had to go get the, what they called the undergraduate handbook, literally like a, a big thick book where they'd have printed all the information about each course every semester. Uh, the past, we can reminisce about it. Moving on, info, week one lab content. Week one lab is actually a self-paced lab. We don't, not running regular labs this week um, because everyone is still getting enrolled in them. We do have three self-paced, um, uh, three help sessions, which are listed on the lab one page. Wednesday, 4 p.m., Friday, 10 a.m., and Friday, 4 p.m. So hopefully you'll be able to get to those three sessions. Um, one of those three sessions, if you're having a problem, if you have no problem with the lab tasks this week, you don't have to go to those drop-in sessions. They're only, um, only a good idea if you potentially have never done a computing, computer science course before and you're really confused about all the tools I'm talking about. In that case, they would be good to go to. Or if you want to go and say hi to some of the tutors and just have a yarn about art and interaction computing. That would be cool too. So lab one is self-paced. The idea is to set up the, the tools on your computer. Make sure you've got VS Code. Make sure you've got Microsoft Teams. Make sure you can log into things and make sure that you understand kind of the, the workflow for, for Comp1720. We'll discuss that a bit more in a minute. Um, and it has this typical task-based flow, task one, task two, task three. That will be familiar as you go through all of the, the labs in this course. So it's very important that if you're new to computing, you do this lab and if you have any issues, you ask about it either on the forum or in person at the drop-in labs. Assessments. I'm going to talk about this very important topic that everyone wants to know. What are the assessments for this course? Folks, the assessments for this course are as follows. There are, going backwards, there is a major project. In this course, I'm asking you to create a piece of interactive art with computers. So you're, that all this making is leading to a major project. It's a 50% assessment, but it's not a, an overwhelmingly huge project. It needs to be something which is engaging for about three minutes. And if you go through all of the assignments and labs for this, this, uh, this course, you will have had plenty of practice and it will not be a challenge to do a basic major project. It can be as challenging as you want to make it, right? I know that some folks spend weeks on their major project. They really think about it, really craft it. But to do something which is just at the satisfactory level, it doesn't have to be too, um, too much of a burden. We give you support over three weeks, week 10, 11, 12. Actually, just let me remember the labs. I think maybe four weeks. Yep, from four weeks, from week nine, everything in this course is all about the major project. So there's uh, week nine, 10, 11, 12. We help you to frame your idea for a major project. And then after week 12, you deliver it um, on 31st of October, 2022. 50% assessment. So we have three assignments that are each 15% assessments. And the assignments basically have the format of being a minor project. So you've got a small art project, small art project, small art project, big art project. The assignments have more limitations. The major project is quite open-ended. The assignments have specific limitations and a very specific uh, task for you to do. Um, I'll talk about assignment one in a minute because the the um, specification for it is already available. I haven't made the, the template repository available for it yet though. Then lab tasks. So 5% of the, the assessment in this course is work uh, from your labs and your weekly creative making practice. So there's actually two kinds of assessments in the labs, lab tasks. There's pre-lab assessment and there's in-lab assessment. I'm just going to go to the this page here where I discuss that in detail. So each week you will do the pre-lab work. It's a uh, creative task that will ask you to do something and then post it on the forum. It's not supposed to be something that takes hours and hours. It's some, something which is supposed to just get your brain thinking 
and connecting between the lecture content from the week before and the lab content for the current week that you're getting to. So you're transporting ideas from lectures into expression for the labs. And then in the labs, you're going to practice your creativity and coding by performing some small tasks and putting them into GitLab. I'll talk about GitLab in a bit if that's a word that's unfamiliar to you. So pre-lab, due by the start of your lab, you submit that on the course forum. In lab, due by the start of your next lab, the week after, and you submit that on GitLab. So I think maybe the lab task pages, I need to tune some of this. It's not quite exactly as we're doing it this year, but it'll be obvious once we get to week two, which is the first assessed lab. Let's just have a look at the week two content, just so I can tell you, give you an example of a pre-lab. This is the first marked assessment task that you will do in this course. This week's pre-lab task is choose one artwork discussed in the week one lectures and then an artwork or other media slash experience slash artifact. Include a picture or reference that you have experienced or found online. Explain why these two works could be considered art. Give them at least one reason that they are artistic in different ways. Ooh, interesting. So remember that you have to follow the lab task procedure and you only need to write 100 to 200 words about these. So I'm, I'm really not looking for a long lab task, just a short, um, a short post on the forum before your lab. <laughs> so looking at the lab task procedure in lab pre-lab process, you log on to the Comp1720 forum. I'll click on that right now. Here we are. The Comp1720 forum is at a website called discourse.kex.anu.edu.au. It looks similar to Discord, but it is not Discord. It's a, a, a piece of forum software called Discourse, and we're running a, a version of that on our ANU servers. So then the Comp1720 forum is here, slash C slash Comp1720. C stands for category, so it's one of the categories of this forum. There's a different category for each class that uses it. So when we're on the forum, this is what you'll see, and you can see here that we've got different subcategories here. And the first subcategory is the pre-lab category. I need to adjust the about so it's got some text. But if I was making my week two post, I would go into the pre-lab category. I'm gonna say, you know, art two, a tale of two artworks, artworks. And I'm gonna say, the artwork I will discuss is blah, and the other one is do. So two artworks, I should be very computing and say foo and bar. And then I'm gonna do one more thing, which is I need to add a tag. It says optional, but it's actually not optional for your pre-lab work. Week two, you can see I've got X599 here and lots of similar topics. It's because I have access to all the previous 1720 forums and you can see all of these artworks going back through many years. Week two, okay, Comp 1720, pre-lab subcategory, week two tag, create topic. So I've started you off with a topic. It may be, I think I've got this very clearly here. Yeah, post your topic in the Comp1720 category and the pre-lab subcategory. Add the week to N tag to your post, where N is the week in your diary entry. Then you look in this week's lab to find out what the pre-lab task is. Write 100 200 words to complete the task, uploading any images as necessary. Some of the tasks will be a bit more kind of theoretical. You just talk about some stuff. Some of them will be, please go and write a small program in P5 and upload the result. Then the second thing you have to do, or the final thing, is to find two other students' pre-lab entries that you find interesting and write a short comment telling them what they, what's interesting about it. So you need to do this post, you need to do these two pre-lab entries, and that will give you your small mark for the pre-lab uh, for that week. If you haven't got your week end tag, or you haven't posted in the category, we won't be able to find your post automatically and won't be able to give you your mark. So we periodically go through and try to figure out where people have, have forgotten either the tag or the subcategory, 
but it can be tricky to do it regularly. If you haven't done the two other comments, and this is before the start of your lab, you also won't get a mark for that part of it. So it's, it's not just about writing, it's also about reading and discussing and having a community. So this is the point of this activity, is to build our community of practice in creating interactive art with computers. Okay, we'll talk more about the lab tasks a bit later, but I can say that you get, I think you get half of the credit. Oh, here we go. There's someone says my lab is today, but there's no marks for this week one lab. So you're not, not doing any lab task marks until week two, week two to 11 inclusive. So there's no lab tasks that are marked in week one. Week one is a, is a practice lab, basically. And week 12 doesn't have any marked labs either because you'll all be doing the major project in week 12. For the labs, you get, I think you get half the credit just to get started on your tasks. And you get full credit if you've done all of the tasks or at least attempted all of the tasks. So if I look in my tasks for week two, there's pre-lab task, then your lab tasks, find a partner, make some program in P5, do something else in P5, and then something to do with Pledge of Integrity. Not sure about that. Might change. There's a few things I have to just proofread and make sure they're still worth doing this week because this seems like a lot, a lot. This year, I mean. Uh, we're always changing things every year. Nothing ever stays the same. Okay, getting information and help. If you find that you need help at any time, it's 2 a.m., it's the day before your lab and you need help, well, put a post on the Comp1720 forum. Maybe likely what will happen is that no one's going to answer at 2 a.m., but I might wake up the next day. First thing I do is check my email at work. Second thing I do is check the Comp1720 forum and find out that there's a post from you. And if it's something that I can just off the top of my head answer, I'll just type in the answer. And then maybe you've been helped. The great thing is that when you post publicly on the forum with questions or ideas or thoughts or panics, maybe there's other people in the class who are also having that question or thought or query or panic. So there can be many questions asked and it will help everyone if you ask those questions. For regular questions, you don't need to have a subcategory. You just make make a regular post, okay? Here's a question in the top level, 1720 category. Help. Oops. Create topic. Oh, it must be at least 20 characters. Blah, 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 blah. So you can't do questions that are too short. Someone else might, might find this later. Oh, there's voting. I don't really know what, oh, nine votes left. Hmm. Remove my vote. Not quite sure what voting is. It appeared we updated um, discourse and now we have voting. <laughs> so that's novel. Um, we used to have a kind of completing, a tick box thing to, to be here, but we'll figure that out later if, it, if it's needed. So there's a question, someone else might answer it and then you'll have a, have a bunch of replies. So this forum is the best and quickest way to get help. Please don't email me questions. I get many emails a day um, that are really urgent and important and often student emails with like, oh, my VS code doesn't work are not urgent or important and I don't get to them. And then they get lost in my inbox and then they don't get answered. So if you have a really, a burning question about the course, you, our expectation is that the first place you ask it is the forum. If you really need some other help, just make sure that the answer isn't already on the course website as well, because we've got many answers to many questions. And one place I'd like to point you to, two places, is first of all our help page, which gives you some advice about getting help in this course. The second place is our policies page. So if you need an extension, something's gone wrong with your assignment and you or your life in the days before the assignment's due, and you're not gonna be able to get it in on time, please ask for an extension. We've got discussion about our extension policy here. And we have a new thing called the School of Computing Extension app, which allows you to ask for an extension. This is borrowed from, from um, 
the Fenner School of Environmental Sciences right now. We're trialing it this semester. So you might notice this in some other computing classes. If you're a student from CAS, you will have already seen this. Come 1720. Uh, this goes to course contact Brent as well as me. Assessment title, assignment one. You fill in some stuff, support statements, and submit it to me and I will get to that shortly. I don't answer those things every day. In general, in the first instance, you don't need to have special documentation like a medical certificate or something to get an extension. Just tell me what's going on with you through that app and if we need more information, I'll ask. But in general, if something's gone wrong, you tell me what it is, that will sound reasonable and we'll give you a short extension to help. Um, if there's something worse that's going wrong with you, it might be that you need to apply for special consideration, some kind of unexpected and unavoidable issue. Special consideration is not for extensions, so if you want an extension, you do the, the regular extension application. Special consideration is like, I need to do some kind of dramatic rebalancing of assessments to work for someone because they had a serious issue in their life, which meant that they not only weren't able to get an extension, but um, uh, you know, need to have the, the assessments adjusted in some major way. Obviously, that's something I'll have to put a lot of thought into and may well require some more, um, more supporting documentation. Um, there's information here about appeals. There's information about supplementary assessment, important information about academic integrity, but I'll discuss that later. But a lot of questions are answered here. And also really important is our communications policy. Basically, it says, ask on the forum first. If it's not appropriate for that, um, sending it through email, only if it's a private issue that can't be seen by anybody else. DMs on the forum are great as well. I'm happy to see those. Particularly, there's a link here which will send a direct message to me as well as your tutor or all of the tutors. It'll go into um, the admin's inbox. I oh, don't know where that link's gone. Anyway, I'll find it later and show you. <sighs> yeah, so that's communication. I know we haven't even got to the live coding bit. I haven't got a lot of lecture to go. So I've been talking about all of the way that the course works. Academic integrity. This course is a collaborative place, but our assignments are individual assignments. That means that I expect you to reference all ideas, code, and content that is not created by you. You will get a special file in your assignments called statementoforiginality.md where you put your references. You're expected to work together in labs. It's actually a required part of the course to be collaborative. You're also expected to be finding bits of art, taking inspiration from online and other places. But you need to be aware of how to reference appropriately and accurately to acknowledge your sources. This is about, uh, not about, you know, obeying the law. It's about just being a normal, honest person, which is if you get a great idea from um, an artwork online, of course you acknowledge that idea in creating your work. If you get a great idea from your friend or have some amazing discussion or a part of a group of friends who are developing uh, something, some other bit of software and you're inspired by that process in this course, of course, use that, that work, use that effort and collaborative capital that you've put in. You should use it, it's valuable, but tell me about it. And in fact, when you tell me about your references, it's not like you're subtracting marks from yourself. You're probably making your work better because it's, it shows, demonstrates that you live in a collaborative world, that you have a network of peers that you're using to build your work. And because I value references, because I value it, I'm making it a requirement. So you are required in each of your assignments to acknowledge at least two references in your statement of originality. And if you don't have at least two references, you won't get as good a mark as someone who has. It is a requirement, basic requirement for our assessments. If you want to know more, please read the course policy on academic integrity. I also recommend this page, the ANU's Academic Integrity Best Practice for Learners. It's a long page, there's a lot here, but there's a, uh, a lot of interesting discussion about the, the best ways to behave when you're a student. Folks, I, I'm, sh don't have to tell you that all of your work that you submit at the ANU goes through some sort of, of um, academic integrity checking. In computing, we tend to run things through 
a system which searches for software similarity, which will tend to pick up if two students have submitted the same assignment. And if that's the case, obviously there's an issue that needs to be worked out with those students and the ANU's process for academic integrity investigations might have to occur. But in general, academic integrity is a positive process. It's about you being collaborative and acknowledging the world that you live in. And it should be something that we all value, not be afraid of. Finally, expectations. The expectation from us, you can expect us to help you and support you ahead of time through our communication policy. The expectation for you in this course is that you engage early, participate in your labs, and you make every single week. Make your, your work. And the warning is, at this stage, if you're watching this lecture and thinking, this seems easy, I don't need to watch the other lectures. Lectures and labs are where we communicate our expectations for your assessments. If you don't show up, you're unlikely to know what to do. And it happens every single year that there's a few folks who who have, get busy with other courses, don't go to their labs, they get to the major project and they do something and I look at it, I'm like, this is not an interactive artwork, this is something else. And they haven't really understood what, the, what it is to, to make an artwork and they haven't put in the practice of making week to week to build that process of creativity. And it may be that some of these students are okay at coding, they've been taking other computer science courses, so they've written a computer program, but it, it's not an interactive artwork. Um, it's not, not that it's horrendously difficult to make an interactive artwork, but you need to pay attention in our labs and lectures to see this context that you exist in. So you're expected to participate. I think that's pretty normal to expect that if you're taking a course, we want you to do the learning activities. Final admin points, course reps. This is an official liaison between you, your peers, me, and the world of courses at ANU. So course reps gather feedback from classmates a little bit. Um, we have some of that process automated through Wattle now, and they attend meetings with other course reps and influence your education. If you wanna be a course rep, read this post on the forum and send me a DM. And I'm looking for nominations by 9th of August. So hopefully have a diverse team of, of course reps this year. The post is on the, on the Comp1720 forum if you're searching for it. Okay, any questions of this part, admin part? Before we get on to some coding and arting. Oh dear, so I've, I'm just, you know, many things need to be sorted out today, first day of class. One thing is that it's actually not quite possible to complete lab one yet. We're still having some issues with that, so. You can certainly get started with it, but the final step where you um, where you actually find it, uh, get your circle on the internet, is not going to work. And <laughs> my tutor is saying, not a good idea to release the lab until it's available. And I agree, but the lab is currently released, so he'll have to change that. <laughs> Brent, where is he? Brent's just chatting to me about the labs, not knowing that I'm lecturing, I think, so. I'm just gonna start, let's just call Brent and see if he's, he can tell me what to say to everybody. Brent, you're live on the Comp1720 lecture. Uh, hey everyone, welcome to Comp1720. Yeah, this is Brent, he's, um, he's one of our, our senior tutors. Brent. The lab pack is not working at the moment, is that right? Uh, yeah, well, it's not that the lab pack is not working, it's the live server that's not working, and depending on how the live server is fixed, it may require okay. an update to the uh, lab pack. So I think that the lab pack is currently public, so if you could just change it to private, and people can stop forking it, if they are. Um, right. I feel like I've seen a few, a few forks of that happen already. Right. And then for folks watching the lecture, We'll try to get this sorted out today and we'll post on the course forum about when the lab pack is ready. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Okay. Thanks, cool. Brent. Bye, everyone. Bye. All right, see? I haven't seen any other questions in the chat, so I think oh, maybe I'm on the wrong channel. Teams. Oh, there are probably a million questions. No. 
No last for pre one. No. Okay. Cool. Um, thanks, Melody, for posting things that are already in my my lecture. I've got this at the end. Dan Schiffman's videos. Um, okay. Now we're getting to the the content for the day. Okay. How are we going to make art with computers? We're going to leave the interactive bit for a little while, a few weeks. We're just going to start with making some art. A little quick glossary. So. We've got a, these words called p5.js, um, which is a JavaScript library for making interactive code art. We're going to talk a bit more about what that means in a minute. JavaScript is a programming language, also just called JS. It's a programming language which runs in your browser. So that means that if you're looking at a browser, a web browser right now, you can run JavaScript code. So you're ready. We use this word sketch to refer to the programs we make in this course, and it's a, it's a bit of a different way of framing programming. Where framing programming is an artistic process, where rather than making big, complete programs that we build over many weeks, we do lots of sketches, right? It's like, it's like drawing. You do many sketches and then do your completed drawing after your practice sketches. So this is all about this repetitive process of making that I was talking about before. Browser is your web browser, e.g. Firefox, Chrome, Safari, Edge, hopefully not. I think Edge is fine now, um, uses the Chrome engine. An editor, a program for writing code. In this course, we use an editor called Visual Studio Code. I wonder what, what little weird repo is going to open here. This is an editor. I'll show you this probably next week because I haven't got the lab pack right now, but we're going to talk about a, a way of writing some sketches online. This is your editor. You'll, you'll be familiar with this in your labs primarily. It'll be your main way of doing the labs in this course. It's called Visual Studio Code. It's available on all operating systems. It's a, it's a big complicated bit of software, but it's easy to get started with it. And we've got a lot of support to help you uh, get organized with getting started in Visual Studio Code this semester. So if you follow through Lab 1, you'll see some screencasts that help you get this installed. Then finally, last bit is p5.js online editor, which is what I'll tend to use in lectures. This is a, an in-web browser editor for writing sketches in p5.js. Here's what it looks like. This is my editor, here's my code, and when I press run, press play, my my code will end up over here. So we can do our first bit of programming, or this is the default sketch.js, the sketch.javascript file. If I press play, we get the default program, <gasps> a gray square. I bet you didn't think we were going to get so far in programming today as to draw a big gray square in the, in the web browser. I'm just make that a bit bigger. So this is going to be the live coding experience for this, uh, typically in this course. I'll be coding something up in the P5 online editor, um, which should be super fun. P5.js versus JS. So P5.js is a library, and a library is a bunch of code, perhaps written by someone else, not the creators of the, pro of the programming language. A um, bunch of code bundled together with a similar purpose. Now P5.js is a JavaScript library, um, for doing creative code. And it gives you a, a, a specific environment for making graphics, making interactive things. It's written in JavaScript, but it doesn't, it's not the same thing as JavaScript. So sometimes in this course, I'll say P5, P5.js, P5.js, they're all the same thing. If it starts with P and has a five in it, I'm probably talking about P5.js, the JavaScript library. You don't need to worry too much about it because in all of the template code and in the, the web editor, the, this library is available by default and sort of already set up for you to get started in. P5 reference. Now, a library is not much good without a way of figuring out what's in it. And the way to figure out what is in P5.js is the reference. This is your most important resource in this course for finding out what to do. There's a lot of, lot of information here, but you start, look at this page, you start to see interesting stuff. Shape. So if you want to make a shape, you should look under the shape sort of header. And there's a bunch of different shape things you can make. Circle, ellipse, line, point, quadra quad quadrangle, rectangle, square, triangle. It's quadrilateral, I think. And then 
different kinds of curves and 3D primitives if you want. We don't do 3D in this course, just the 2D stuff, but they're there in case. And some other stuff as we go down, you'll learn more about this as we go through the course. These are all of the different things that you can do in P5 that P5 comes with. So if I say the reference, I mean that website, p5js.org slash reference. Now, painting, we're gonna make some art in P5. A P5 sketch is kind of a digital canvas for painting. And we already can see that in the web editor because we've got this, this is actually our blank canvas. The first thing that happens here is create canvas 400 comma 400. And the second thing is put a background on that canvas. And we'll discuss more about how which things happen after which things in, in the next lecture. But in our canvas, we're gonna draw lines, shapes, and other things, and that's gonna be how we create our artwork. And we have colors for our paintbrush. Two colors, actually. One's called the fill color, and one's the stroke color. So if you're painting a line, you just get the stroke. And if you're doing a shape, you can have a different edge for that shape as a the color you use for filling it in. So the edge and the interior of the shape can be different colors. And as with paint, as with paint, the order matters when you're making uh, art in p5.js. So you, if you paint red paint on and then paint green paint over the top, well, if the red paint's dry, you'll get green over the top of it if you put it on thickly enough. So the order matters. If you're painting one shape and then have another one on the top, they will appear in, in the reverse order than you've, you've got the code. We talk more about this flow of code and how that, how that um, changes our art in the next lecture in week two. We're gonna try one in a minute. I just wanna show you a few more concepts. So this is the grid. You might know about coordinate systems from doing maths in high school. So you remember when you had to have this kind of X, Y plane and over to the right, going this way on the Y axis, there'd be positive numbers. On the left, there'd be negative numbers and X going up would be positive numbers and X going down would be negative numbers. So that's like the eighth grade version of, of a coordinate system. But in computer graphics, the way it works is that up here in the top left hand of your screen, there's a point called zero, zero. That's the home point. And then in the X direction is horizontal. Going out is positive numbers, no negative numbers here and Y going down is positive numbers as well. So you start up here and go positive as you go out to the right and down. That's how computer graphics tends to represent places in the screen with these different coordinates, all in a big grid like some graph paper. So the unit of our locations on the screen are called pixels or PX for short. And it tends to be that on a modern, many modern screens, um, the pixels are quite small. Often the pixels in P5 are sort of artificially made big. They don't exactly correspond to one pixel on your screen. One pixel on your screen is like one little light inside your, your um, LED display. I haven't had any jump, questions jumping out so far, which is great. Colors. So we're talking, we talked about painting, we talked about the grid, and we're gonna talk about colors, and then we can actually make something. RGB. So if you're looking at this on a screen, your screen will have usually three different kinds of color elements in it. It either has little lights, or it has little shades that go in front of a big white light in the back of your screen. And the shades can either be a red color a green color or a blue color, little filters that blank out the light, the white light or, or let it through with that color. And you can combine these three colors, R, G and B, to make any color, red, green and blue. So they're the primary colors of um, a, in an additive color system, red, green and blue. You can combine them to create any other color. And generally in computer graphics, we define, or the default way of defining a color is through different levels of red light, green light, and blue light that your screen can create. So we'll talk more about colors in week three actually, but this is the start of it, is just knowing these three primary colors and creating different levels of them. 
So in P5, we specify the different red, green, and blue components with numbers, and the numbers go between 0 and 255. If you have never studied computing before, you may think, that's a weird number to choose, why would they choose 255? And if you're um, a computing student, particularly one who's taken Comp 2300, you might say, oh yes, 0 to 255, so 256 different levels, that's 2 to the power of 8. One byte represents each, each number, each color component. And again, if you're new to computers, you will have just heard a bunch of static right now and have no idea what's happening. But these, it turns out that 0 to 255 is a significant kind of range in computing. It's, it's like in, in regular, the regular world if we say something is between 0 and 100. That's 0 to 255 is kind of similar to 0 to 100 in terms of being convenient. So if you want to make some colors, you can combine different uh, these different red, green, and blue components together to get red plus green, you can make yellow, red plus blue, you can make purple, etc. We'll have more detail about colors in week three. So, vocabulary. P5 only understands certain instructions. So the question is, how do you know what to say? How do you know what to say? We look in the reference. Here's some, um, some things from the reference. This is a command for um, for P5 called ellipse and it's got these numbers inside here so we're going to command a bracket there, a parenthesis, a closed parenthesis and some numbers in between and then this little semicolon at the end command brackets numbers in between semicolon at the end so ellipse and fill here are called functions. Oops, where's my, my little... Uh... Ellipse and fill are functions. Uh, I need my red, green texture or red texture. These are functions. So they're like the commands of P5. They tell P5 what to do, what function to perform. And many of the functions are about drawing things on the canvas in P5. So I think it's now time to try these out because I'd like to see what they do. I'm just going to copy them in one at a time to P5. I'm going to put one in here. I put it in between these curly brackets here. Um, you'll understand more about why I did that in later weeks, but I'm just added ellipse and I'm going to press play to see what happens. <gasps> Something's happened. I now have a circle. And it's weird, like the circle is at the top right hand corner of the screen, which is a bit odd. 0, 0, 100, 100. M that must mean something important. We'll figure this out in a minute. Let's add fill. Okay, I'm going to do it in the same order as it was in my slide. And we'll run this and see what happens. Actually, I'm going to move all this into this other one. This will be more fun. I promise it'll be fun. I press play and nothing has changed. I've got my, my circle. I press stop, it all disappears. So I'm not, it's not some kind of slate of hands thing. Press play, nothing changes. And you might be screaming at me, but Charles, you haven't set your paint color before starting to paint. It's like I've just gone into the garage and gotten a new paintbrush out of the packet and drawn a circle on the wall. And then I'm confused about why I can't see it. In fact, I want my red paint. So I'm going to get my red paint, dip my paintbrush in the red paint first, fill, and then I draw my circle after that. And now I get a red circle. So we'll come back to this in a minute, but the, it turns out, as it turns out, and you may have guessed this already, the order of the commands that you're giving to P5 is important. If you try to draw the circle before dipping your paintbrush in the red paint, your circle won't appear. I actually don't need this draw function today. We'll get rid of that. Okay. So, a few more terms. Syntax. Now in language, syntax means the structure of words and phrases in sentences. And in computing, this means the structure of statements in a programming language. So, 
a significant thing to get to come to grips with this semester for you will be the syntax of statements in JavaScript and specifically in P5, the, the library of P5. Now you may have noticed that we've got these numbers after these statements. And in fact, there's a few others here. Create canvas, that's got some numbers after it. Background's got a number after it. Fill has got some numbers after it. And ellipse has got some numbers after it. So it's sort of a, a, a meme in P5 or in programming that you'll have like some function and then some numbers. And in fact, some other stuff bit of text, um, array of words. You can have other stuff inside those two curly, those two parentheses. But you have to have the right stuff in between them. How do we know what the right stuff is? And what are they even called? What, how do we talk about these things? Well, as it turns out, as it turns out, the function with an opening bracket and a closing bracket has numbers here and those numbers are called parameters. So within the function, the function is the name of it, here's the name, fill, and then there's the parameters. So we say that the fill function takes three parameters and in this case 250 is going to be red, 0 for green, and 0 for blue. So that means that our color is going to be mostly red and no green and no blue component. Now the cool thing is that parameters mean that a function is reusable. We could structure our programming language so that we don't have parameters. We just said dip red paint and maybe some in, in JavaScript you tend to have a open bracket, close bracket for every function just to say this is a function. Dip red paint and then another function called dip blue paint and you know dip purple paint. This is this will be a very complicated library to run because every single color would have its own function. But the way it works is that we have one function for all of the colors that's reusable in some way. Okay, so you can also use parameters in the ellipse function. And I'll just tell you about this. The ellipse function has two parameters here. That's width, 100 width and 100 height. And these two parameters are at the center of the circle. So right now, the center of the circle is at 0, 0, 0x, and 0y, which means it's in the top left-hand corner. So let's put this one in the middle. And we'll get an ellipse, a red circle right in the middle. Okay, big red dot. That's exciting, isn't it? Why don't we make it a, a kind of wide red dot? 250. Now we've got a, a big pulled out red dot and we'll make it a circle again or make it really high as high as our, as our sketch. Just going to jump back into the chat and see if there's any thoughts or comments. None so far folks you're learning so well. Let's make it a normal sized red circle now. So how do we know what these parameters do? How do we know what the parameters do? We look in the reference. So if I go to the reference, and this is where the search bar is really important. It's big, bold, right at the top here. You want to know what the, the, the ellipse function does? You look up ellipse. And here's an example. Ellipse 56, 46, 55, 55. It runs here. You can actually edit the example. And it runs right your, in the box. Run and experiment with it it will give you very specific details here about the syntax of this function and the different parameters. X, Y, width and height, and then there's some other stuff that can be added in some cases that you don't have to worry about. So if it says optional parameter, optional, you usually don't have to worry about that. And in fact, if you only want a circle, you don't even need to specify the height, I think. So we can, I think I almost always will do a four parameter yeah, there we go. You can just do a circle if you have like a complicated number. It will keep changing. So we can making a circle. Cool. So functions are what to do. Ellipse is make a circle and parameters is how to do it. 
We could play with the fill function a bit as well. Fill is actually a little bit complicated as a function because there's lots of ways of specifying colors. Um, so we'll learn more about this as we go, but definitely the way that you'll be worrying about it is this V1, V2, V3 alpha. <laughs> Number red, green, blue, and then alpha is if it's, you can make it more, more or less transparent or see-through. So I can make a green dot by putting in 255, blue dot by doing 255 there. But I think I like my red one. I'm gonna make it as a little bit tinted and not quite so strong. Not brown, that's, that's not really what I wanted. There we go. Slightly blue tinged red, a bit more subtle. Okay, debugging. Now, if things go wrong in your program, things go wrong in programming all the time. We already had this discussion. What you need is not for things to not go wrong because they always go wrong. You need feedback from your computer to figure out what's happening. Now, if we're in the web editor, we get this feedback right down here. If I type something that's not right, or if I type circle, I'm, I really want an ellipse, but I've forgotten that it means ellipse. Uh, or I just, I mistype ellipse with one L. Get rid of that one. Now I've gotten it wrong. I am getting a bit of feedback here because you can see that the, the editor has no, noticed that ellipse isn't really an, a word it knows. The functions it knows, it tends to make bold. Once it doesn't know, it's are not bold. That may not be a problem, but let's just run it and see what happens. Now we've got this little message here, a message from P5. You know it's a message from P5 because there's a little flower. P5.js says, it seems you've accidentally written ellipse instead of ellipse with two L's. Please correct it. And then there's also a message from JavaScript having the technical version of this error Reference error, ellipse is not defined. So someone in P5 world made it so that they would have really nice, friendly messages that have a flower. So like if you've made a mistake, it's just gonna give you a flower to start with and then it's gonna tell you about your mistake. But in JavaScript world, it's not very friendly. Reference error, you're in big trouble. You're not in big trouble. Just cause it's red, doesn't mean the computer is angry with you. It's just telling you, giving you feedback, <laughs> giving you a critique. But actually, if you're using P5 in VS Code, um, using our tools, you won't get that nice web editor, but you can still see these messages. And the way to do that is to go view developer, developer tools in Chrome. You can use any browser will have these. Um, I can see developer tools and see the console. Um, and there is my, sorry, it's very, very small. There is my P5 error. And you can see, look for the little flower to see what P5 is telling you. And then here's the uncaught reference error ellipse is not defined. So you can see why they really wanted to give you that, those nice flower errors because it can be hard to work out what's going on with the other errors from, P, from processing and JavaScript. JavaScript is quite a friendly language with errors, um, which can be good and bad. It's good because you make some mistakes and it's like, ah. Oh, Look, I can see that's not really right, but I'm just gonna to try to run it anyway and see how we go. That's JavaScript's approach. Some other programming languages, if you've got any error, it just gives up not doing anything. So JavaScript tends to have its best try and sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's bad because you might end up with a program which is half working and you're not sure why. It's not doing what you want. So it's important to know how to check the, the console, the JavaScript console. So I'm gonna fix this error, put the other L in and go. Yes, here we are. Okay. So comp 1720 workflow. <laughs> I'm gonna run it anyway, it can never cause problems, surely. No, it, well, it can be good, but it's, it's more like there are different, some functions you've set up will have some error and then it, runs that once, it doesn't work, but it runs the other functions, but something's being set up in the first function was needed in the second. Anyway, it's complicated, but 
We try to avoid errors, <laughs> basically. So you'll edit your code file in your editor, run your live web server, and then you'll point Chrome at your browser to view the page. Every time you save your sketch.js file, the web server tells Chrome to refresh, and the lab one contents your training in this workflow. I'm not gonna go through this now. I'll send you a, um, talk to you on discourse about how to do this when the lab um, repo is ready, hopefully this afternoon. And then we'll have everything ready to go. So here's the, the conclusion of this lecture, the last half hour. We're gonna talk about this question. What, what is art? Or I should look at this way. No, which way is the right way? I, I wanna look into my screen. What is art and how can we make it in P5? What is art and how can we make it in P5? This is the question which you could potentially be asking for the rest of the semester. So I'm, I'm not holding back with the hard questions in this course. We may as well ask them now rather than wait. What is art? Well, sometimes when you think about art, you might think about something like this, a, a lovely picture. And this is definitely a lovely picture. This is a picture by Albert Namajira, uh, one of Australia's most famous and celebrated um, Aboriginal artists. And Albert Namajira had a particular wonderful um, artistic practice and was really able to very extremely well capture the Australian landscape, which was very popular in, in the time that, that Albert Namajira was, uh, became famous in the 50s. And very sadly, Albert Namajira died quite young, 57, um, and was caught up in, in things that many Aboriginal people were caught up in at the time where Aboriginal people weren't actually Australian citizens. So they were kind of treated as second class people and not afforded the same care and concern that they should have been by uh, governments. And something you can read about if you want to, but a very sad story. So um, the not titled landscape is just a, a famous artwork. It sits in our National Gallery of Australia here in Canberra. And it's a, a wonderful image capturing Australian landscape. I'm gonna tell you today that this is in some ways not the kind of picture that you wanna make your first attempt at, at making art in P5 because this is a picture made with paints and with a brush. And although we have something that's like paints and a brush in P5, we're really doing, we're doing shapes and colors and you can't combine the colors like they are in this, in this artwork because paints work differently than screens and a brush works differently than the shapes that you get to play with. So I would suggest when you're thinking about art in this course, don't think about what is the best art I can think of. I would like to try to make that. Think of what is the art that I can best make with P5? And that's where the practice comes in. You wanna develop your artistic practice with P5 through the labs, making different kinds of artworks every week and trying to improve on that process. High level, what is art? Well, Plato, 375 BC, would have said that art is imitation. So art is about copying something out of the real world. Something like this, right? This is copying something out of the real world and imitating it. And I guess Plato's view was that the, the efficiency or, or goodness of that, or the platonic view is the efficiency of that imitation and goodness of it increases the goodness of the art. Now, the philosopher, Kant in 1790 AD, so 2000 years later, wrote that um, in German, I don't know what he wrote in German, but in, translated into English, it was written a kind of representation that is purposive in itself. So representation, that means it's a representation of something in the world. Um, and it's not just a description of it, but it has its own internalized purpose. So the art exists separate from that thing in the world it's not, its role is not just to represent it, but it has its own image, its own or its own role as being an artwork independent of the thing that it's, that it's, um, it's representing. So this, this picture, not titled landscape, is not a photograph of this landscape to just tell us a landscape is there. It's a painting which is beautiful in itself. The landscape is beautiful that it's representing, but also the painting has its own internal role separate from the landscape it's representing. And now in the 20th century, things have kind of changed a little bit. Uh, Michel Duchamp, and we'll talk a bit more about 
um, Duchamp and contemporaries in the early 20th century would say that maybe art is anything, question mark, question mark. So art is anything that you call art. It's not just about representations. It's not just about, uh, not just about imitation. It's just not just about being a pretty picture. Art can have many roles and many contexts and many, many things about it. Um, so I want you to keep that in mind as I ex hopefully expand your view about what things art can be. And particularly the 20th century view is that art can be a great many things. Now, one of my, my colleagues, Dr. Tony Curran, um, <clears throat> said this in 2020. He's a friend of Comp 1720, a lecturer previously. Um, Tony said, when something is done so well that it exceeds the function of the thing that it is for, that's what art is. Art is something that has a surplus or excess of je ne sais quoi. And I think it's significant that Tony describes art as something that exceeds the thing that it is for. That sort of relates to that Kant uh, idea of something that's purposive in itself. It exceeds its function, but it's not just a representation. It's, a, it's just anything that exceeds its own function. And it's also significant that Tony can't even speak in English when speaking about art. He has to use French. So je ne sais quoi means I don't know what. So it's got a surplus of some special quality that you can't quite name. Even if you try in French, you have to refer to a French phrase representing how much you don't know about what it is. So there's a surplus or excess of je ne sais quoi. Which of these pictures is art, I would question. And this is an open question for the folks in the chat. Are one of these art and one of them not? And if so, let me know what it is. I would say, I would say that this one on the right, someone's saying both are art. Well, that's great. I mean, this one is a, is beautifully done. Latte art. This one is beautifully done too. This one is, it seems more like a cup of coffee. Like its function is, it's, it's really good at being a cup of coffee that you just drink. This one is not going to be very good at a cup of coffee. So it's, it's become playful in a way, which is even more, uh, exceeds the, the je ne sais quoi quotient is, is rising because the foam is escaping from one cup into the other. It's now not going to be very, not going to be very easy to drink. <laughs> oh, someone's saying it depends on the person's perspective. Uh oh, the perspective card has dropped. It depends on the person's perspective to see what the images depict. Okay, <laughs> question two. What about this one? <laughs> Oops. Is this art? I think that this is where we start to get to, you might see what I, I mean when I say that the, the previous two things are both normal objects in the world, cups of coffee. I'm not, I'm not arguing that certain things are and aren't art. I'm saying that, the, I guess I'm going to say at the, at the second time that this one is, if we look at je ne sais quoi, this one's got some je ne sais quoi, like just, it's just really well done. This one, certainly rising. This one, the je ne sais quoi quotient is off the scale, through the roof, out the door, on its way to the moon, because it is a cup, which is for some reason fur, and but still set up as a cup. So it's just really, it raises more questions than it answers. And it's just a very, a very strange object. And you think like, why is it still a cup? Like, is it a creature? Is it supposed to be an animal? If it was supposed to represent a cup, it's obviously nothing that you could drink out of. So it's a really strange interpretation of cupness. That's what's making this, the je ne sais quoi go out the window. It's a fluffy cup. Um, and it's, in fact, it's a, a, a work created by an artist called Merit Oppenheim in 1936 called Object. So Merit Oppenheim has not even named it a cup. The, the, the cupness has been removed, particularly in the name. It's not even going to be a cup anymore. It's not a fluffy cup. It's an object. 
And obviously we can see it, our perspective is, oh, it's a cup with fluff fur on it, but the, um, the artist has worked, done some work to remove that from it. And here we go, um, we got some, uh, some rel related posts in the chat, things that can make people feel kind of uncomfortable. <clears throat> I'm, I'm showing you these things to raise questions, not, not provide answers really, but certainly if I was to raise the artness of these things, this would be the lowest artness next, and then the highest would be this one. That's my, my perspective. Um, others can contribute what they think. Art and material, and this goes back to the Namajira painting. Sometimes it's good to consider the materials we have and make art that suits them. We're not painting in watercolors here. We're making computer graphics with P5. So what materials do we have for making art in P5 right now? These are our materials. We can make a circle. We know how to make a circle. So far, that's all we know how to do in P5. So let's look at some art made of circles and see what other artists can do with circles. Here's a, a work by Sonia Delaunay called Prismes Electrique, 1914. This one, uh, Circle Gang, let's go. This one sits at the uh, Centre Pompidou in Paris, the, the uh, Modern Art Museum. Here's a work by a Canberra artist called Jody Cunningham. Uh, and this was designed, a, a work that's designed in um, for the Woolley Street at Braddon as a kind of play on the uh, idea of an archway entering, you often see in, in um, uh, Asian culture imported into other cities in the world where there would be an arch to represent a certain precinct. So a gateway arch crown for Woolley Street. And this one also includes, as you can see, many circles as the main geometric element in this work. Here's another one, Bridget Riley from 1964. I love this work called Hesitate. And it's very much looks like computer graphics. It's, it's not. So this one has um, uses circles of different height. We know how to do this, different height and different fill to make something that looks like it's going like this, even though it's just a flat, um, a flat painting, emulsion on board. Amazing. Just circles. You can do this today with what we've done already. Here's a piece of art that I worked on. I'm a musician, so I make things that are both musical and artistic. An iPad app made of circles. This app is called Phase Rings. And I performed it in many, many times, many places, but also performed at this particular exhibition at Drill Hall Gallery at ANU called Color Music, which also had many circle-based artworks in the background, you can see. Symbol shapes turn into artworks. So a few examples of different kinds of artworks that just use the work that you've got. And we're gonna go a bit deeper on this in a minute, but I'll talk more about one other shape. We're gonna do not just circles, but maybe we'll do rects as well. And a, a rectangle is gonna be made with this kind of syntax. So rect is the function, and then we've got four um, parameters, and the parameters are x, y, width, and height. And the x, y re refers to the top left corner of the rectangle. So here's my rectangle. So who else has worked with rectangles? And you can see that I'm, I'm gonna talk in a, over a few slides about a particular artist embracing constraint over their career. And this artist is someone called Piet Mondrian, uh, died in 1944, so certainly well in the past now. And Piet Mondrian's work was, main working period was over 100 years ago in the early 20th century. <clears throat> this artwork is called Red Tree, and you can see it's quite detailed. There's, a, there's a, clearly a tree form but there's a lot of simplicity in the color. There's really just the, the primary colors from the additive color system, or the subtractive, sorry, for painting, which is red, yellow, and blue. 
you might have learned in primary school about primary colors. It turns out that primary colors work differently depending on the material. There's two main things. There's paints and dyes, which tend to absorb light. And then there's light uh, filters over lights, which tend to be additive. So if you've got colored light, you can add it together and make new colors. If you've got paints and you add it together, they remove colors. So the, the primary colors are different. We'll talk about that in week three, color systems. But Pierre Mondrian's using the, the primary colors from painting, red, yellow, and blue. Then a little bit later, this was first one, 1909, second one, 1912, still life with ginger pot. So this is, is also detailed, but it seems like it's getting simpler. Like it's, it's quite hard to see what's going on here, but it's, if you look closely, you start to see, oh, it's a scene from a kitchen or a, a studio. Maybe it's a bit of a mess. There's windows and, and canvases around. Artists' lives can be messy sometimes. A glass on the table. And that's the, the ginger pot, maybe some cheese, I don't know, a, a board or a knife. Then things start to change. Here's still life with ginger pot too, also 1912. And you can see that Mondrian is removing elements of detail and starting to focus on particular geometric shapes and lines in space, just horizontal and vertical lines. And then things change even more dramatically. 1915, composition 10 in black and white. Just using two colors, black and white. And now not using shapes, just using lines, up and down lines, vertical and horizontal to create this artwork. Composition 10. 1944, the end of Mondrian's life. Mondrian created these, these works called the compositions in in different colors, composition with yellow, blue, and red. This work was a huge hit <coughs> in the mid-century period. Um, it's famous, people wore it as a dress, right? It was printed on fabric. Um, it became really symbolic of modern art. And you can see it has, has some of the elements that Mondrian was working over his whole career, over the previous uh, 40 years. What are those elements? Horizontal and vertical lines, simple shapes, and primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. So then there's the, the black and white still as well from composition 10. So you can see Mondrian over his whole career went from painting pictures that represented things to painting pictures that were constrained in the representation and then eventually breaking free from representation as a, a primary goal and just working with the constraints and the materials to create really unique artistic objects. Composition with yellow, blue, and red. So, last few minutes of the, of the, uh, the lecture, we're gonna do some coding. We're gonna make a Mondrian style composition and we're gonna use basic shapes and basic colors. So, I told you about rect if you wanted to look it up in the syntax, we can do that. There's rect. You can see there's some different, some extra things you can add, extra parameters to make it rounded. But I'm basically gonna just work with the, the red rectangle and those lines. So I'm gonna get rid of my circle for the moment. I kind of like that color, but I really want my red rectangle to go somewhere else. So I'm going to move the, I'm going to stick it to the top part of the screen, zero. Just see what that looks like. Now it's moved up there and I'm going to move it along. Move along and go to 150. So now I want my red rectangle to extend all the way to the edge of the canvas. So we have to do a bit of maths. The canvas is 400 pixels wide. And I start at 150, so now I need to do 400 minus 150. What does that give me? 250. I'll make that a comment. You can see I've got two, two forward slashes there. That means that this line of code 
isn't a line of code anymore. It's just a comment just for me to read. So it's all grayed out. That means the computer can't see it. Okay. Oh, 250 was my, I wanted 150. And then I want it to be 250 wide. There it goes, all the way to the edge of the screen. Now, if you're new to programming, this may seem like magic, but I can actually do the maths inside the number there. And any little bits of maths you do like that, the computer will just work out the answer and use that as the parameter. So that works too. Now I want a blue rectangle. So what about my, my I'll just type it again, fill. 15, 15, 225. That's green. No, that's blue, isn't it? And I'll make another rectangle. And this rectangle is going to start down here, I think, on the left hand edge. So x is 0. And I'm going to maybe start it quite far down, 300. So this one is going to be 150 wide because I want it to come out to match up with that side. And then I'm going to make it a 100 tall. <laughs> uh, Melody's in the chat with some exciting um, takes on modern art. There's my blue one. Yeah, but where's your where's your uh, Mondrian composition then, Melody? <laughs> so I've got my red shape and my blue shape and I need a yellow shape now or I'll do a, a a yellow one because I really want to live in the the paint world not the the RGB world so I'm gonna to have to make some yellow can you make yellow again this is the problem with R RGB it's often hard to guess what colors are gonna have how to mix the colors together. Um, and often it's smarter to not use RGB when you're specifying colors in P5. So I'm going to make my yellow square uh, somewhere down here. I want it to kind of go to there, be over here in this corner here. So it's going to be tricky. I've got to work out a good place to put it. I might put it at 300, 3, 300, 200. Just, I'm just going to press go and see what it looks like and then change it. Now it's the wrong color. How do I make yellow in RGB? Someone help me. Color, converter, color picker. Here we go. Ah uh, yeah, red and green, sorry. Silly me. There we go, there's my yellow. Yeah, someone suggested 255, 2550. If I did that, it would be a... You kind of get yellows, which are colors that are too strong. They don't look right. Yeah, it's just... Ugh. Don't you think that? Look at your screen. I mean, every screen, different screens can tend to be different, but I always want to soften it a little bit. So I'm going to take down the, the, the max from 255 to 225 and just chuck in a little bit of blue as well, just to make it a little bit more high, a little less high contrast. Oh yeah, semicolons are optional here. I don't know. It's, <laughs> I should have my semicolons. JavaScript doesn't care if you have semicolons or not, unless you're trying to do lines on one, do two things on one line. Like it can, it can run this, this works. Fill and then rect. But if I delete that semicolon, it doesn't work. Hmm. JavaScript, hey? Yeah, there's all the computer science students in the chat are collectively freaking out that JavaScript can be so loose with its syntax because some other programming languages are like, no, you need to do it exactly this way and no other way is acceptable. Yep, nice. Uh, make my, I just got to be accurate here. I want it to be exactly 100 in width and 100 in height. Oh, that's my blue one. Uh, 
Okay, now I've got my my rectangles. I need some lines. How do we do a line? Line, and we go have four parameters, which are the starting x y and the ending x y. So I want a line that goes down here, just like that composition. So the line's going to start in that corner of the red rectangle, which was 150, 0. And it's going to go all the way down to 150, 400 is down there. Okay. There we go. There's my first line. Oh, I'm looking better already. It's the 1950s all over again. I'm going to have my second line, this horizontal one. So starting at x is 0, because I'm all the way to the left. Then the height of that red rectangle, which is 120. Then the right side is 400, 120. So all of these, whenever I do a line, straight line across the canvas, two of the Either the width or the heights are going to be the same because I'm moving it down. So the the x and or y, or the in this case the y of both ends of the line is the same as I'm moving it down the screen. Another line, cool. Do another line down here. Just copy that one and change the y's. Blue rectangle, my lot y's is 300. Okay, and I need one more line, but this one's tricky because I want it to end there. Go from here to the bottom of the screen. So, oops. The X starting point for the yellow square was 300. And my Y starting point is going to be the height of that red rectangle, which was 120. And then we go all the way to the end of the screen, 300, 400. Wow. What does it need? What does it need? I think it needs slightly bigger lines. So how am I going to do that? Well, if I look in the reference, Let's have a look down here and get shapes. Colors and rendering. Stroke. Stroke weight. So stroke is the color of my lines and the edges of my um, of my shapes, but stroke weight is a command which is going to change how big the line is. Someone thinks it needs a circle, come on! Now here's the cool thing, if I do stroke weight up here, what are the, the numbers that are possible? Uh, one is default, four is thick, I see it's like number of pixels. Four thicker, ten beastly. I think I want beastly lines, so I'm going to make it ten. If I do that one stroke right at the top, it will work for all of the lines in this sketch. Yeah. Stroke weight, actually. Whoops. Now they're... Ooh. Yeah, see, I really want them for the, the lines, but not for these edges, outer edges of the shapes. So that's not going to work, is it? I put it down here before my, my line section. So now I've got, I'm missing one there, I need one more line, line 300, 200, 300, 400, I think that's right because that starts at 300, 200, that's there, and then the other end of the line is 300, no not 300 across, it's 400 across, 300 down.
Ah, someone's asked, why do each of the shapes have a black border added to them? Well, I'll tell you why. Because, I'll just comment that stuff out for the moment, I'll tell you why. Well, by default, when you draw a shape, it draws a outline for it and a fill color. So we can actually change the outline color with this command, stroke and fill. They're the two main kinds of colors. And we can make the stroke red as well. Bright red. So you should see that. Whoa, it's a weird bright red stroke around each line. I'm just going to make the stroke weight big, beastly, so that you can see that really clearly. Oh, stroke weight with a capital W. If Often this is sort of typical standard practice in JavaScript. If there's two words in a function, the second one has a capital letter. There's that massive line, massive line around each shape. So I actually want to get rid of the stroke. I'll make my, my color black again for the stroke, which is default. And I want to not have it. So now I've just got my shapes, no lines around them. And then I'm going to do my lines in black with a very heavy stroke weight. Uh-oh. I made a mistake down here. That was this line, 300, 200. That was only 200 down. There we go. And someone says it really needs a circle, but I don't know, can live within your constraints. <laughs> live within your constraints. Okay, it is 11.59. Folks, thank you so much for coming to my first lecture. I will tell you as your parting suggestion, these three bits of advice. These are three dangers. Danger one is that the code stuff is too easy, or you think it is, and you check out until week 10. Very dangerous. Similarly, do not sit on very big dangerous rocks at the beach. Very dangerous thing to do. Make sure you go to your labs. Even if you, if you think the code stuff is easy, go to your labs and see how easy it really is. Because our labs are to do with not just code, but also developing your artistic practice. And it's something you need to develop over 12 weeks not just do just the major project. Second stuff is, second danger is the code stuff's too hard, I'm out. Uh, this happens sometimes with folks who are, are new to coding. We're here to support you. We've worked with this course with thousands of students over the years. And in general, we've had some really wonderful success, um, success with students. Someone's saying, is the discourse private? I can't even access it. Uh oh, I'll work with that on that one later. Um, sorry about that, if there's an issue there. Second, um, yeah, code stuff's too hard. As I said before, the, um, the course may seem like it's moving very fast in the first six weeks to develop your code um, programming understanding. Then it slows down and, and really focuses on developing your practice in the second six weeks. So if you get through the first six weeks and feel like you're sweating, but you're okay, that's fine, that's normal. Last time, last one, the art stuff doesn't matter. I'll just submit some working code and bam, HD. Well, I'm here to tell you that unfortunately, the learning outcomes of this course are related to not just code, but also art and interaction. So you need to understand that interacting art with computers, interactive art with computers, all three are important for this course. Further reading and watching, I wanna say that there's a wonderful teacher of P5 on the web called Dan Schiffman. There's a link here. The Dan Schiffman's videos have already been posted in the chat by one of our friends of the course. Dan Schiffman is a wonderful educator, teaches in, at art school in New York, um, teaches creative coding, and is involved in the back end of P5 and developing these systems as well. So, um, wonderful contributor to this field. Make sure you look at the Lab 1 content this week, really important. Look at the P5.js reference and examples, and look at the JavaScript docs on Mozilla Development Network if you're into code and you want to learn more about JavaScript. One last thing I will say, I'm going to announce this to everyone later, is that the first assignment is actually due rather early in this course. It is due in week four. So you need to make sure you're on top of it. It is to create a monster in P5. So draw a moving monster. 
And with your work this week in week two and week three, you will be able to create a monster without too much trouble using the skills you know. And this is something which is definitely comes a little bit early in the course, but is that really the right? Oh yeah, 15, eight due on the 15th of August. It is definitely due a little bit early, but that's to make sure you get a good start with this course and get started with all of your processes. So you can get started on that shortly. We should have that the template repository available to you shortly later this week. And with that, I'm off folks. I've got to go and work on some other stuff. Thank you for joining me in person today, those who chatted in the team. Thank you for watching later, those who are watching the recording. I will catch you folks next Monday. If you have any other questions about that before then, ask me on the forum. See you folks later.